Good morning. Good morning. Pastor Brent's over at uh, Price Hill preaching. Pastor Dave's in the question and answer period. Uh, is there one after this session too? So uh, for those of you who are members who got the, the letter, the newsletter, um, if you have questions and you want answers, we've got comments, uh, Pastor Dave will be uh, fielding all of that, those questions uh, later on. So I encourage you to, to participate in that. Um, and the, the timing of this, of this sermon and, and me being here today is really kind of interesting because of all that we're going through as a church. And um, we did not plan this. I mean, we, we do worship retreats and we plan the sermon series and, and we get to uh, uh, put things in, but we don't know what's going to happen in the life of the church in our lives. And so some things just we, we leave to providence. We just leave that's God's will. And so we just try to live into that. So um, if it doesn't make sense to you, don't worry. I say a lot of things that don't make sense. Just nod your head, say amen, and I'll hurry up and get out of your way. That's, that's just how they do it at Price Hill. Amen? All right. See, that's already five minutes less. I'm, I'm almost done. I'm almost done. Give me an amen. We got it going. So we're talking about wisdom. And as you can see, it's wisdom. Dumb, dumb. And, yeah, dumb, dumb. Night of the Museum. Yeah, dumb, dumb. Yeah. All right. Okay. For those of you who know. And so I used to hang out with, when I was in Lima, right, I used to hang out with what they call the old church saints, these old church mothers. These are the, the older uh, women in the church. And uh, the church mothers were always good for giving you some good wisdom, real simple stuff. I mean, just, but it would just kind of blow your mind, like, wow, that's, that's pretty deep. And I'll never forget this one mother. She said, uh, you know, there's a difference. She, we were talking about wisdom, being smart. And I thought I was pretty smart, but when you sit with the church mothers, you realize you're not smart at all. People who have been through life, you realize you don't know anything. So you just sit and be quiet. And uh, the one mother, she sat there. She said, you know, there's a difference between being ignorant and being stupid. Uh, my ears perked up because in my house, you could never say stupid when we were growing up. We were not allowed to use it. But she, she, she explained some things. I'm like, okay, that makes sense. She says, ignorant, being ignorant or ignorance is when you don't know. You don't have knowledge. You haven't been taught. You just don't know. You're ignorant of something. That's not a bad or good thing. It's just a fact. Now, somebody can teach you, and then once you know, then you can act on that knowledge. She says, but stupidity, being stupid, is when you know better, but you don't do better, right? When you have the knowledge, but you don't use the knowledge, she called that stupid. I thought that was a pretty helpful definition. How about you? The difference between being ignorant and stupid, right? Has anyone here ever been ignorant? You can come on. Don't lie. You didn't. Okay, we all learned something along the way. Anyone ever been stupid? Yeah, the dum-dums. I'm the chief. I'm the chief dum-dum. For me, the definition, I have a definition for wisdom. I think I got this out of Proverbs, and this definition for wisdom is a combination of having knowledge, someone teaching you or having uh, learned something, and having experience or understanding, knowing what to do with the knowledge. And then the third piece is just, and then doing the right thing, right? For me, that's wisdom. First, someone ha you have to know what to do. You have to have information. You have to have knowledge. But then you need to know what to do with it, right? So this flies in the face of those of us who love Google. Because we think that we have wisdom because we know we have Google. Googling it and knowing what to do with it is not wisdom. Those are two different things. So wisdom is having the information. You can Google it, but do you know what to do with it once you have the information? And then do you do the right thing with it? So this morning, I want to talk about doing the right thing. Doing the right thing. I think everyone wants to do the right thing. Proverbs, Solomon starts off the book and he says that the, in the very first chapter, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. If you want to be wise, if you want to know what to do with knowledge and, and have understanding, he says you have to fear the Lord. And the fear of the Lord is the beginning. Fools despise it. So early on in uh, Proverbs, there's this separation. He says, you got to choose, right? You want to be foolish or do you want to be wise? Fools despise wisdom. They, they won't receive anything. And, but the wise ones, they will. So Solomon is setting up a choice. Solomon is trying to instruct his young son so that his son would grow up to be a healthy and productive man of God. And so he says, son, first of all, you have to fear the Lord. Not be afraid of God, not have some unhealthy 
fear of God, thinking that you're going to burn in hell. I'm not talking that. A fear, a healthy respect, a healthy understanding of the capacity and the capability of the creator. Knowing what God can do, but also understanding what God did do. Okay? And I think many of us have this confused. We have a fear. We're afraid of God, and we, you know, we get all scared. Uh, and and it, that causes us to be, it causes a state of paralysis. We won't do anything because we don't want to do the wrong thing. And Scripture is pretty clear. Jesus says in, in the Gospels, he said that there were three servants who were all given talents. Two of them used the talent, and the other one buried it. And when the Jesus figure comes back and says, what did you do with your talent? He said, I buried it. He's called that servant a wicked servant, lazy and wicked. He says, why didn't you do something with what I gave you? He says, I was afraid to lose it. So many of us have that relationship with God. We're afraid of losing it. And that's, what, that's not what God called us to do. He didn't call us, call us to be afraid of him. I like Proverbs. My life verse comes out of Proverbs. I like it because it's simple little truths. It's like in black and white. It's either this or it's that. And I need that. I need it nice and simple. How about you? You like the either or kind of categories? You don't like the gray? You just like, okay, do this and I'll get this result. Do that, I'll get that result. It's pretty simple, yeah? Proverbs uh, does that. Look at chapter 15, a couple verses. I'm just going to read them so you get what I'm talking about. Here's this wisdom. And there's this foolishness that Proverbs lays out, the two choices, the two categories. He says, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. The tongue of the wise adorns knowledge, but the mouth of the the fool gushes folly. Verse 4, the soothing tongue is a tree of life, but a perverse tongue crushes the spirit. A fool spurns a parent's discipline, but whoever heeds correction shows prudence. The house of the righteous contains great treasure, but the income of the wicked brings ruin. The lips of the wise spread knowledge, but the hearts of fools are not upright. The Lord detests the sacrifice of the wicked, but the prayer of the upright pleases him. You see what I'm saying? See the two categories? Kind of righteous, wickedness, wise, foolish. It's real simple. The challenge is, no matter how simple it is, doing the right thing is sometimes hard, sometimes hard to do. Amen? Amen? All right, that's another three minutes. Yeah, good deal. We're working. Get out of here on time. What I found in Proverbs is that there are two essentials in this particular, for this topic. There are two essentials in doing the right thing. One, parenting. Parenting. Because a parent's charged with the responsibility of instructing the child. Proverbs says, train up a child in the way that they should go, and when they are old, they shall not depart from it. They'll come back to it, even if they get off course. Parenting is essential because the parent provides the experience, the wisdom the child needs so that the child can make right decisions as they get older. Amen? Sometimes we don't have proper parenting. I I was looking at some of the topics that that Solomon dealt with with his son. He talks about parenting, picking the right friends, not drinking too much, hmm? pride, words, adultery, discipline. Those are some of the big things that you see Solomon dealing with. And I looked at this and I was like, man, now my dad shared, he's, he's old school, he's from Mississippi. He shared his birds and bees talk with me. Um, and I look at the way that Solomon talked to his son, like, man. Dad missed a few things. I think he was a little embarrassed. Solomon, Solomon was pretty, he kept it real. But sometimes, even though we know the right thing to do, we have great parenting, we still make dumb, dumb choices. Yes? Yeah? You, you ever make a dumb, dumb, have you ever seen anyone make a dumb, dumb choice? Huh? <laughs> I've seen a few people make dumb, dumb choices. Check out this guy. Now, I don't know if he had proper parenting or not. I I don't know. And he's trying to, he's trying to rob the drive-thru. He has a crowbar. This this is my money. Yeah. Got a mask on. I don't know. He, he's working. He's, he's diligent. No, that's mine. 
He's going, he said he just needs to go to work. So I said, just go to work, man. Because <laughs> right. he's working pretty hard for that, isn't he? And he's on camera. Now, I don't know if he's ignorant or stupid. I just, but he is determined, and uh, I'll give him an A for perseverance. Like, he's not a quitter. I appreciate that. Those are qualities. <laughs> if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. Uh oh, he's close. He gets it open, but there's no catch. <laughs> yeah, right? Wow. Wow. We call that a dumb dumb. Yeah, there he goes. Dries off. Nice car, too. I'm trying to figure out why are you robbing McDonald's? That's a dumb dumb move. Now, can, can, can we bring up the lights just a little bit? Because I need to see the, the audience just, just a little bit. We, we, we've, we've done this uh, at Price Hill, and, and so we have to take a pause in the sermon. I'm still going to get you out of here on time. Don't worry, but this is just part of it. And, and we go about and we ask folks, have they ever made a dumb, dumb choice? And, and if we have a dumb, dumb story, if you are willing to share your dumb, dumb, we have some dumb, dumb suckers. Yeah. And so you, you'll see people all eating these dumb, dumbs around Price Hill on Sunday mornings. But they wouldn't share their dumb, dumb story. I left the dum-dums on the uh, platform, and I said, okay, if you don't want to tell your dum-dum story, you can just grab a sucker. We'll all know that you were a dum-dum at some point in time in your life. You just didn't want to share it. Anyone want to share a dum-dum story? You want a dum-dum? They're good. We got a dum-dum story over here. All right. On my 13th birthday, mm-hmm. um, well, this is for me and Brooklyn, so sorry, Brooklyn. Oh. So on our 13th birthday, um, our dad went out and got us um, Dunkin' Donuts, and mm-hmm. so we had our so we had we so we got coffee, and Brooklyn set hers on um, on it was basically like a part of the couch, and it fell over and spilled all over the carpet, and then I and so we were rushing to clean it up, and I saw this and I saw this spray, and it said. And it said like um, cleaner, it gets off stains, and so I started to use it, and I started, and I saw the carpet started to look like really like matted. And when my mom came home, she told me that that was um, grease remover. <laughs> oh, nice! You did that to your dad's carpet? Your mom and your dad? You get two for that one. That's pretty good. <laughs> Give her a hand on that one. Isn't that good? And the fact that you embarrassed your dad. I love that. I love that. You reacted with grace. That was grace. The dad's hiding his face. That's grace. Anyone else? Any other dumb, dumb stories? No? We, do we have one over there? Huh? No? She's like, no, call me out. Mom saying, yeah. Daughter saying, yeah. No? Is that it? All right. Okay. We have one more. We have one more over there. Jerry, would you grab a dumb, dumb? Take one. Okay, I uh, attended a church for the first time and uh, was getting getting introduced to people and things like that. And um, there was a woman who um, was a bit chubby. And uh, so I asked her, when are you due? Oh. And um, she said, oh, honey, I'm not pregnant. I will never ever do that again. Wow. If, if, if a woman doesn't volunteer that information to me, I will not ask. Thank you. <laughs> that was- <That's- laughs> See, then that's what you call wisdom. She's sharing wisdom with us, right? What you don't do. That's awesome. Thank you. One more? Give me one more. Uh-oh. Oh, we got a- Doesn't matter. You, you pick it, Maggie. Okay, I had just gotten a new car, and uh, I went to pay my rent at mm-hmm. my landlord's, and, uh, and, and I knew it was late, so I wanted to hurry up before they saw me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I get the check out and get my, my payment and shut the door. Okay, I come back, and there I am, standing, 
Cars running, keys in the car. <laughs> I know everybody's probably yeah. done something like this. But it, was, it took me a half an hour. And, of course, the landlord comes out, talks to me about my rent being like this. <laughs> Dumb Dumb, thank you. Thank you. It's, yeah, thank you. See, Dumb Dumb stories are liberating. They're great, yeah. Well, you, you'll get a Dumb we'll, we'll share. You can share with me later. And you'll get, still get a Dumb Dumb. Dumb Dumb stories are liberating, right? When we can laugh at our foolishness. It can be liberating. See, I think God looks at some of the stuff we do and he's like, man, you're, you're really a dumb dumb. Like, <laughs> like, he's not mad at you. He's like, come on, you know, you know better. I, I've shown you better. Um, but to be able to, to get that out and to share that, to look and, and look at other folks, you know, foolishness to me is sometimes fun. I kind of laugh at that. I shouldn't, but I do. Um, but I'll laugh at my own uh, stupidity as well. But choosing uh, is a, a very important element when it comes to this thing called wisdom. You have to make the choice, and no one can make the choice for you. You have to make the choice. Therefore, you are ultimately responsible for the choice that you make. So if you make the wrong choice, and, and we don't always know that it's going to end up being the wrong choice. Sometimes we're responding out of our emotions, Sometimes we do know, we've thought about it, but we just make the wrong choice, and it has unintended consequences. Be responsible. I screwed it up. Own it. Don't push it off on someone else. Own it, and then we can move on. We're increasingly living in a society where we don't want to be responsible for our own choices. Not that we always make the right choice, and that's the thing. This is not about always making the right choice, but this is about you are ultimately responsible for the choices you make, and I am too. And many times, we do it out of ignorance, and sometimes we do it out of stupidity. I think God puts it all together and just calls it foolishness. But we want to choose to do the right thing, and we want to do things right. That's where we need to go. And in doing the right thing and choosing to do the right thing, you and I are our own worst enemies. It's not your spouse or your children. It is not your boss or your employees. It's, it's you. It's me. The issues that I have with other people really aren't about other people. It's me. It's you. Issues, it's you. And that's a hard reality, yeah? Because it feels much better for me to blame Mikey. Right? Those kids, those folk over there, that feels good. I feel justified in staying the way I am and doing the things that I do. But I believe that God is challenging us in this sermon series. He's challenging our church in this season. And we've got to make some choices. Right now, Jer is getting into the swing of our son. Jeremiah is in the swing of, of golf. And, and we, we're going out, and, and I'm watching him as he's developing, as he's learning. And there are some, some things that he's done that are, that are right, but I've seen him doing them for the wrong reasons, right? And golf to me is a great game because golf really pulls out your flaws. Isn't that right, Danny? <laughs> Danny has none. That's why he's a great golfer. I'm just saying. He says, he says I don't know what you're talking about. Flaws? What? It's a foreign word? But the game of golf um, invites you to really play against yourself. It's, it, you're really not playing against anyone else. You're playing the course. You're playing against yourself. And I'm watching my son as he's on the driving range and he's working and he wants to hit the ball real far. And, and he gets up there and, and he'll get a couple good ones. And he even made a statement the other day. He's, he said, you know, uh, I got a little proud. I got a little proud. And the ball just did the exact wrong thing. It didn't do what he wanted it to do. And I watch him as he gets distracted, and I want him to stay focused, focus on the target. And he begins to look at the other people and what other folks are doing and, and gets distracted from his primary purpose. And every time he gets distracted, he gets the wrong result. He's doing the right thing. He's practicing. He's learning golf. He's trying to accomplish this thing. But he gets his eyes off of, of what he's doing, starts focusing on other people, and he gets the wrong result. Doing the right thing for the wrong reason, someone else's attention. And we'll get caught up in a conversation about this, that, and the other. And I'm like, get back on it. Focus right there. 
And once he focuses, boom, he can accomplish what he's trying to accomplish. I've also seen, and we did this just yesterday, seen him do things, do what we would call wrong things for the right reasons. If you're a golfer and you're ever out there golfing, you know you get one shot. You don't get mulligans or a breakfast ball or a do-over unless you play with the guys that I play with. We, we, we have our own rules. But you're not supposed to. You play the ball where it lies. You hit it wherever it goes. You, you deal with the consequences of that. But yesterday, as I'm trying to get him to develop some healthy habits, and I could see him having this really negative conversation with himself. If he hit a bad shot, he would get down on himself, and he would drop his head. And I'd hear him saying negative things. And I didn't want him to do that, and so I would, he would hit the shot, and if it didn't work out right, I'd throw another ball down. I said, hit another one. Hit that one. If it didn't work out, I'd throw another one down. Hit that one. Until he hit one that felt good so that he could gain the confidence. Now, if you're, And we were on the course. There weren't a lot of people around, so we weren't holding people up. But we were doing the wrong thing. That's not how you play the game of golf. But we were doing it for the right reason, trying to teach him how to develop the proper attitude and the proper self-talk. Because I don't want him going through life being negative. God doesn't want us going through life being negative, and the conversations we have with ourselves will determine whether or not we end up where God wants us to be or not. We are our own worst enemies. And the way we talk to ourselves, my goodness, we should be ashamed. God wouldn't talk to you like that. And so we were doing the wrong thing for the right reason. I I give you that because it's really difficult sometimes to know when we're talking about choices. It's really difficult to know whether or not this is the right thing to do using our own wisdom and using the rules that we play by or we live by. Sometimes it's really difficult to discern that. And so I want to turn to James chapter 4 to get in a little bit deeper into this, uh, this subject matter. James chapter 4 is dealing with a group of people who are having issues because they all have a different understanding of what is right and what is wrong. They all have a different idea of what wisdom is and what they need to do. And so in James chapter 4, starting at verse 1, he says, What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You want something, but you don't get it. You kill and you covet, but you cannot have what you want. You quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. And when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives. That you may spend what you get on your own pleasures. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred toward God? Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God, or do you think Scripture says without reason that the spirit he calls to live in us envies intensely. But he gives us more grace. He gives us more grace. This is what scripture says. God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve and mourn and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Amen? That's another two minutes. When we are in a difficult season, in a difficult situation, he says, you're you're having this conflict and this tension, and... It's because of the issues within you. You're being awfully selfish right now. Therefore, you can't compromise. You can't work together. You can't partner because you're only thinking about what you want, what you need. You're not thinking about the bigger picture. So he says, ask God. Ask God. Because we're not going to stop life from happening. We're going to hit crossroads after crossroads, and we're going to have to make very difficult decisions. We don't know the outcome of the decisions until we make the decision. So he says, ask God. In one place, James chapter 1, he says, ask God. If you lack wisdom, ask God who gives liberally. He's not going to withhold wisdom from you. 
And as we ask God, he says, now draw near to God. You've been a dum-dum. Maybe you've made a bad choice. Now draw near to God. Repent. Clean, clean yourself up. Wash your hands and draw close to me and I'll draw close to you so that you can start making the right decisions. You can start doing things right from now on. Church, we have to get out of the past. We have to get out of regret. We've got to get out of all of that because it's not doing anything for us today and it will not help us for tomorrow. All it will do is cause us to withhold. It will cause us to close up and continue to set up barriers around us and other folk. God compels us to go forward. Anyone who has chosen Jesus as Lord and Savior, you made a decision to enter into God's family. Jesus calls it the kingdom of God. And when you chose the kingdom of God, you chose to be a friend of God and not a friend of the world. And the world operates by a totally different set of rules. The way the world sees us is very different from the way that God sees us. And that's what we're battling within us. We know the right thing to do, but it's very difficult to do it because we're still hanging on to what we know from the world. But you and I left the world. We said we wanted the kingdom of God. We wanted to be friends with God. So we have to choose. We have to choose. Jesus offers us the gift of salvation. We didn't have to pay for it. It's a gift. We just receive it. But there is a responsibility that we carry with this gift. We have the responsibility of teaching the ignorant about a king who will give everything for their lives. We have the responsibility to heal the brokenhearted, to release the captives, to heal the sick and the lame. We have that responsibility because we are in the kingdom of God. And we pray the disciples' prayer. Thy kingdom come, let thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That means at, in Delhi. That means in the gymnasium. That means in my heart. That means in Cincinnati. That's not just some utopia up there. We're saying you come and rule inside of me. You rule our church. You rule my household. You rule my job. Your will be done, not mine. And so the challenge, brothers and sisters, if we've made that decision to be in the kingdom, the challenge is now we got to humble ourselves and submit to the king and allow God to be God. And we need to get off the throne and just obey what God is calling us to do. And when God calls you to do Something you better believe, it's going to be on. It will be so far beyond your expectation and your expertise. My parents moved us out into the country when we were little. I grew up in the country. Our church was in the city, so I had this really neat experience of being on a farm and being in the city. And what I've come to know and what I've found out, and I believe it's true, wisdom is contextual. What it takes to be wise in the city and what it takes to be wise on a farm are two very different types of wisdom. If you want to survive on the farm, you better know what you're eating. I'm just saying. I've eaten some bad stuff. If you want to be wise on the farm, you you, you, you might want to be a little handy. You're going to need to know the difference between pliers and a screwdriver. You're going to have to learn how to fix things and problem solve for your survival. In the city, you're going to need to know what neighborhoods to avoid. You're going to need to know who you can align with because they'll protect you. And and it's it's a total different type of survival. And the wisdom that parents teach farm kids and the wisdom that parents teach uh, urban kids, it's just a little different. But it's the wisdom that they need to survive in the communities that they grow up in. The problem with us is that we think our way of growing up, our values are right, and the others are wrong. And we make a judgment because I didn't grow up where you grew up, and therefore what you're doing is stupid. 
to me. Or what I'm doing is stupid to you. No, what it is is you are ignorant. Or perhaps I'm ignorant because I did not grow up with you. I don't know about your, your world. I don't know about your community. If you teach me, then I know I have understanding and I can make the right decisions. Church, we have the responsibility of teaching those folks about the kingdom of God and being in a relationship with Jesus. We dare not stick our chests out and become prideful and arrogant as if we've done something to earn salvation. We did nothing. Jesus chose to sacrifice his life. And we must live sacrificially as a result. There's a movie, Do the Right Thing. I love it. It's really challenging. Spike Lee. It's not for the faint at heart. It's definitely not for children. But it deals with some very difficult subjects. It's, we need to watch it. It is real. It's a setting in 1989. It's in Brooklyn. You got these different groups. You got the Asians. You have an Italian pizzeria owner. You have blacks. You have all types of folks in this community, residents and business owners. You have the police. And it's on a hot summer day. And you know that the tension is rising and something is about to happen. And everyone is looking at doing the right thing from their perspective. No one's looking to do the right thing for each other. Everyone's defending their own little turf, and you got to watch the show to see how it turns out. It was set in 1989, and it's the same storyline today in 2015. That's the sad thing. It's the same thing happening right now. But there's a guy in there, Radio Rahim. And Radio Rahim says there are two things, love and there's hate. And Radio Rahim says in this thing called life, it's like they're doing, a, they're doing battle. Love and hate, are, they're fighting. And it seems like love is, is losing and hate's just landing some blows, but eventually love just starts to battle back. And then delivers a knockout punch. Love wins, he says. And then he says, he says, if I love you, I love you. But if I hate you, I hate you. See, in the world, we can love and hate like that. But in the kingdom, we operate under love. That's all we have, church. I love you. I don't hate you, and I am not afraid of you. I love you. That's what we're called to. And if we allow love to win, we will begin to do things right and we will begin to do the right things. There is a time and season when we need to do the right thing and manage what we have. To me, people who say we got to just do the right thing, those are great managers. They get it. This thing is working. Let's just manage it. Let's not change it. And there's a time and season for that. And then there's a time and season to do things right. And leaders know how and when to do things right. And there's this tension between managers and leaders, and they're saying, this is the way it's always been done. And then you have the leader saying, I understand that, but look at what's happening, and look at the signs, and we need to make some changes because this is where we need to be, and we're not going in the right direction. And there's always this tension between doing the right thing and doing things right. And the two groups typically retreat to their camps. We're right, and you're stupid. We cannot be that church. We must be a church that's seeking the wisdom of God and not doing things that we feel are right in our own eyes. We've already, we should have learned that lesson already in the book of Judges. That's the whole theme of that book. The children of Israel doing things that they felt were right in their own eyes and they ended up dying and destroying one another. We cannot do that. I'm no longer satisfied. I am not a manager. Let me just say that. There are times when I can manage, but I am not a manager. 
Our church is in a serious situation right now. We are in a time and season where we need leadership. We need to be a leader for our denomination. We need to be the leaders for our city. We need to be the leaders for our state. I cannot settle. I will not settle for the divide between Del High and Price Hill. I can't. I'm not that kind of a guy. God didn't make me that way. When I see a problem, I have to address it. I am no longer satisfied with people in Price Hill afraid to come over to Del High because there are too many white people. And they're afraid of getting lynched. This, I'm talking real, this is stuff. Understand how fear works. I'm no longer satisfied with people in Price Hill, and this is not everyone, but the folks that I'm talking about who are afraid and we can't come together and we can't work together, I'm, I'm no longer satisfied with folks feeling like they can't trust the police and if they, if they come to Del High, they get pulled over and they'll probably die because of what they've seen on TV. And for some of you, this sounds so irrational, but this is what people think. I cannot settle for people in Del High afraid to come over and worship at your Price Hill campus because you think you're going to get shot on a Sunday morning. I can't settle for that. God didn't call my family from Lima, Ohio to just allow things to remain. I grew up in both white and black culture, and I know that I've been called for such a time as this. I know Dave has been called for such a time as this. We have been chosen for such a time as this. We didn't ask for it. God said, this is what you're going to do. And it doesn't feel good, and I would love to avoid it because I like things that feel good. I don't like pain. Do you? No. I'd rather take the easier, softer way out, but we can't because God called us to lead. And the church has forfeited its rights, its power, and its authority long enough. It's time for the church to stand and not back down. It's time for the church not only to hold our ground, but to take more ground. And we're not going to do it by voting the right person in office. We're going to do it in our neighborhoods. We're going to do it in our churches. We're going to do it one person at a time, one community at a time. We, we have been called for such a time as this, and I know it's scary as everything. But we ask God for wisdom, just as Solomon did. Give me the wisdom. Give us the wisdom to lead your people. Give us the wisdom to lead our families. Give us the wisdom to lead our church and our city. God is up to something. Something is shifting. I can feel it in here today. Something is shifting. And we can't hold on to the past because there's nothing there. But you know what I see? I see you right now. I see you right now. You know what I can hold on to? I can hold on to your hand. That's something real. I can look you in the eye, man to man. That's something real. I don't care what you did yesterday. I don't care when you made a dumb, dumb move. I see you today, and we can work together today to go into tomorrow. That's what I see. I see what's in front of me. I'm not living in the past. I hope you aren't either. God is calling us to do the right things and to do things right. And the right thing to do now is the next right thing. We can't regret the decisions that were made that we had no power over. But we can do the next right thing. What is God calling us to do next? My prayer is that we do it in a spirit of love and not a spirit of fear. The spirit of fear will torment you, create anxiety and undue stress on you. But Paul told Timothy, God has not given you the spirit of fear but of love, of power, and of a sound mind. He says, now you go and become a pastor. Church, God is calling us to go and be the church that Del High and Price Hill and Cincinnati and the United Methodist Church needs right now. So I pray that we will choose to do the right thing, the next right thing, and that we continue to do things right. Amen? Let us pray. 
Father God, you are good. And your mercy endures forever. And we are forever in your debt. Lord, we know that this is a very difficult time. And for some, a very scary time. Because we don't know the future. We don't have a guarantee. Not in this world. But Lord, we do rely on this fact. We believe that you have conquered the cross and the grave and that you're seated in heavenly places right now. And we believe that if you conquered the grave and death, we can conquer any and every challenge that we're facing. God, give us the wisdom to lead your people. Give us the grace and love to be your people. Forgive us for the ways in which we've spread rumors and the ways in which we've built barriers. We're afraid, God. You see our hearts. We're not bad people. We're just scared. Relieve us of the spirit of fear and give us that love. The love that conquers a multitude of sins. The love that sent your son into this world be the living word to destroy the grips of sin and death upon our hearts and minds to give us life and hope 